in the Church Bibles. Jude, verse 1. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James, to those who have been called, who are loved by God the Father and kept by Jesus Christ, mercy, peace and love be yours in abundance. Dear friends, Although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt I had to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints. For certain men, whose condemnation was written about long ago, have secretly slipped in among you. They are godless men who change the grace of our Lord, of our God, into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ, our only Sovereign and Lord. Though you already know all this, I want to remind you that the Lord delivered his people out of Egypt, but later destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels, who did not keep their positions of authority, but abandoned their own home, these he has kept in darkness bound with everlasting chains for judgment on the great day. In a similar way, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion. They serve as an example of those who suffer the punishment of, ex of eternal fire. In the very same way, these dreamers pollute their own bodies, reject authority and slander celestial beings. But even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, did not dare to bring a slanderous accusation against him, but said, The Lord rebuke you. Yet these men speak abusively against whatever they do not understand. And what things they do understand by instinct, like unreasoning animals, these are the very things that destroy them. Woe to them! They have taken the way of Cain. They have rushed for profit into Balaam's error. They have been destroyed in Korah's rebellion. These men are blemishes at your love feasts, eating with you without the slightest qualm, shepherds who feed only themselves. They are clouds without rain, blown along by the wind, autumn trees without fruit and uprooted twice dead they are wild waves of the sea foaming up their shame wandering stars for whom blackest darkness has been reserved forever enoch the seventh from adam prophesied about them see the lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones to judge everyone and to convict all the ungodly of all the ungodly acts they have done in the ungodly way, and of all the harsh words ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These men are grumblers and fault finders. They follow their own evil desires. They boast about themselves and flatter others for their own advantage. But dear friends, Remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ foretold. They said to you, In the last times there will be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires. These are the men who divide you, who follow mere nat natural instincts, 
and do not have the Spirit. But you, dear friends, build yourselves up in your most holy faith and pray in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Be merciful to those who doubt, snatch others from the fire and save them. To others show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. To him who is able to keep you from falling, and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Saviour, be glory, majesty, power and authority, through Jesus Christ our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. John, thank you very much for that. Uh, do please keep that passage open and you might or might not be encouraged by an outline of the sermon which is at the back of the um, order of service on page eight. I like a, a quiet life. I am by nature a bit of a coward uh, and I don't really enjoy confrontation. I'm not very good at arguing. In fact, I normally have the best answer to arguments about five or six hours after that <laughs> confrontation has finally passed. Uh, and I feel that on the whole, with, um, with trying to follow Jesus myself, trying to help my family follow Jesus, and trying to serve this church family, I've got enough on my plate. And all of that leads me to a sort of a default position, which is really to try and think of pretty much everything else as not really being my problem. I become an ostrich. Uh, I, I may be aware that there's something somewhere that isn't quite right, but I just pop my head in the sand and hope it all gloriously goes away. And the book of Jude therefore comes as a bit of a shock. It comes as a bit of a, a, bit of a kick, actually, to Rory. Uh, because it says, part of following Jesus is being prepared to fight for the truth. I must, we must, stand up and fight for the truth of the gospel. And not for the latest, um, not for the latest Christian fad, and not for my personal preference, although I find that a little bit easier, actually, if the truth be told. Uh, I'm quite happy to fight so I get my way. Not for that. Uh, not for the, the, the latest thing that is hot in the Christian world, but for the gospel. Jude is going to tell us that the gospel, the truth about how people are saved from hell through the death of Jesus Christ on the cross, is under threat. And that that is my problem, that that is your problem, that that is our problem and that we must fight. Let me pray for us. Father, this is a profoundly unsettling um, message, and you know my heart. So I pray, please, that you'll have mercy on me, uh, that you'll have mercy on us, and that we might hear you speak. Father, um, enable us to obey you particularly in those areas where we are where we're weak give us your spirit I pray Amen Before Jude uh, calls us to do that he gives us some really rather good news and it's good news that Christians need to hear every day uh, of the week and it's especially precious if like me you find the idea of fighting for the truth, a little daunting. It's good news about our past, it's good news about our present, and it's good news about our future. Have a look down, please, at the second part of verse 1. To those who have been called, who are loved by God the Father, and kept by Jesus Christ. 
Here are three lovely truths if you're a Christian. If you're a Christian, you are called, you are loved, and you are kept. To have been called, to have been chosen by God himself. That's a powerful and precious thing, isn't it? We get a little hint of it. Um, we get a little hint of it w with the whole World Cup stuff that's been going on. Inevitably, uh, at some point, we will have heard an interview with a footballer. Hello, Mr. Kane. Thank you very much for joining us. Tell us, how does it feel to have been called by Gareth Southgate to lead your country? say things like I'm humbled, shocked, delighted, proud, overwhelmed, all those kind of words. We'll get this. If you are trusting in Jesus, then the eternal, uncreated God has called you to be part of his kingdom. He has individually selected you to be part of his family. Not because you're good at football. Not because you're splendid people with an impeccable moral track record. Not even because he thinks you might be particularly promising with great potential that just needs a bit of development. No, he called you because choosing you brings glory to him for no other reason than because he's gracious. You're called into his family, you're uh, adopted into the rights and privileges of the king of kings. <coughs> you have been called. That's what happens when you turned to Jesus, when you repented of your sins, when you said, Lord, have mercy on me, you were called. And the good news keeps on coming. You were called, you are loved by God the Father. Just, just say that to yourself quietly now. I am loved by God the Father. I mean, that's the kind of truth that changes lives. It's easy to gloss over that, I think. It's easy to, to sort of think, yeah, God loves me. That's what he's supposed to do. It's part of the deal. You know, it's his job. But let me challenge you. This week, before you swing your legs out of bed and into your slippers, say to yourself, I am loved by God the Father. Because if you're a Christian... That is true. And whether you feel very lovable or not, whether you've been good or not, even if no one else loves you, if you're a Christian, you are loved by God the Father. Today, the love of God enfolds you. Today, you can enjoy a, a, a relationship with your loving Heavenly Father. That is staggering, isn't it? <coughs> Lastly, you see it at the end of verse 1, you are kept by Jesus Christ. You are kept by Jesus Christ. We sometimes sing, when I fear, my faith will fail. He will hold me fast. Jude is saying that is true. Who does the keeping? You ever have a small child and you want to keep something out of the way of them? It's, perhaps it's a bit cruel, but it's quite fun. You sort of go, ha ha! They flop around down there going. Christian, you are kept. 
by Jesus Christ. Do you think anything will be able to snatch you out of his hand? I'm reading um, Mark's Gospel at the moment, chapter 5. It's quite a roller coaster, it's quite pacey, Mark. But here's the thing you see on every single page Jesus is more powerful than anything you care to mention. Mark is just sort of like parading these things. Evil spirits, Jesus is more powerful. Raging hurricane, Jesus is more powerful. Death, Jesus is more powerful. Sin, Jesus is more powerful. It's quite sort of intense. You're like, Mark, okay, okay, all right, steady on. We'll get this. The power of Jesus Christ, that power over sin, death, creation, sickness, is used to keep believers into eternity. That is astonishing, isn't it? That is profoundly good news, isn't it? He will hold me fast. Kept by Jesus Christ. Nothing is more powerful than him. There is another way of thinking about it, actually. And you'll see in the footnotes um, that actually it could be translated kept for Jesus Christ. You are given as a gift by God the Father to God the Son. How much of a treasured possession does that make you, do you think? I don't know if you've ever been best man. You've basically got two responsibilities, haven't you? There's the speech and there's the ring. You are entrusted with the rings to ensure that that bit of the service goes okay. It's quite a responsibility, isn't it? It's one of the most important jobs. And if you are, if you've ever been a best man, you spend most of your time doing this, don't you? Still got them? Still got them? In the right pocket? And if you're, you know, mother of the bride, you spend most of your time going, has he still got them? Has he still got them? <laughs> Is he in the right pocket? Now imagine that you, the Christian, are being kept to be presented to Jesus Christ on the last day, pure and spotless. Do you think that God the Father will allow anything to prevent, pre to prevent that gift being given to God the Son? Of course he won't. Of course he won't. There, my friends, is real security. There, my friends, is, is real joy. So if that's the good news, and it's profoundly good news that you are loved, that you have been called, and that you will be kept, here's the bad news. Have a look at verse 4. For certain men, whose condemnation was written about long ago, have secretly slipped in among you, they are godless men who change the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ, our only sovereign and Lord. The bad news is this. There are false teachers in the church. Not everyone who claims to be a Christian teacher is really a Christian. You will know well enough that, um, that one of these doesn't make you a Christian. Standing behind a, a lectern at the front of a church building doesn't make you a Christian. Holding a Bible doesn't make you a Christian. Even being able to speak well is no guarantee that you're a Christian. False teachers look like me. 
They look like real Christian teachers. And that is why Jude warns his readers. If the people who, who are denying the gospel turned up at the churches that Jude is writing to and said, hello, my name's Harry the heretic, and I'm here to deny that Jesus is really God, they would have said, on your bike. They wouldn't have given them the time of day. But the bad news is that false teaching is so deadly because false teachers look like real teachers. They look like, they sound like the real thing. So be warned. What are these teachers like? Well, verse 4 is very stark, I think. They are godless men. Men without God. Ungodly. See, it's possible to be polite, charming, friendly, personable, funny, kind, and godless. If people deny Jesus his right to be sovereign and Lord, his right to, to say what's what, his right to tell the truth, his right to command his people, then they are godless. And their teaching reveals the state of their hearts. What's it Jesus says? He says, um, he says figs don't grow on thorn trees, doesn't he? He says, by the fruit of someone's life, you'll know what their heart's really like. Which, if I may say so, is why you need to know me. You need to know me, and you need to know David. Because if false teachers look and sound like me, and look and sound like David, you need to know what kind of tree am I? What kind of tree is David? Do you see the fruit of repentance in my life? Do you see in God's grace that I'm struggling to grow as a Christian? To become more like Jesus? Well, in that case, in God's kindness, Rory probably is a Christian. But if you don't, then be warned. Where will we find these teachers? Well, again, the news is bad for us. Have a look at verse 4, please. <laughs> For certain men whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. Where will you find these teachers? In churches like ours. In conferences like the ones we go to. Standing behind lecterns like this one. Writing blogs that all our friends read. That's where you'll find these teachers. They're not out there. <laughs> They're in here. You see why, why it's not incidental that when, when we stand up to preach, we say, please keep your Bibles open. <laughs> it's not just a sort of a, you know, it's not, it's not like a waggle on the tee. It's not just sort of like getting ready to play the golf shop. Rory goes to a little routine. He says, please keep your Bibles open. No, he's saying, I might be a false teacher. Get your Bibles open. Do you know that I could be leading you to hell? So please have your Bibles open. That's why I say it. That's why we say it, because it's a matter of life and death. Because godless men have slipped in amongst us. I am, I'm rather gullible, so I tend to believe everything I see written down. And being sort of, apparently, according to my children, towards the top end of middle age... I now listen to Radio 4, and I believe almost everything that's said on Radio 4 as well. Um, because, you know, quite a lot of it's true. They tell you the news. Today in Paris, this happened. Uh, President Biden met so well, that's good. And then, of course, what happens? Well, now it's time for thought for the day. And so I think it's on Radio 4. It's got to be true. Sometimes they have bishops on. It's bound to be true. And I'm eating my porridge, and I'm nodding. And then I think, What? No. Really? I don't... Is that... Can that be... 
I'm sure you're more discerning than me, but it's very easy, isn't it? When you trust the medium and the person sounds nice and just to be carried along with what you hear. My friends, false teachers are not out there. They're in here. And they're beamed directly into our lives and living rooms through the telly and the radio and the internet. I've always been helped by um, uh, something I've heard said uh, that Abraham Lincoln said, which was, of course, don't trust everything you read on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> what do these godless men teach? Well, I've touched on it already, but, but look down at verse 4. <coughs> They're godless men who change the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ our only sovereign and Lord. What do godless men teach? Well, they say stuff that sounds great. They say stuff like, in the end, love wins. They peddle what is, is sometimes known as cheap grace. An American theologian described their message like this. They, a God without wrath brings men without sin into a kingdom without judgment through the ministrations of a Christ without a cross. Jude says they changed the grace of our God into a license for immorality and they deny Jesus Christ our only sovereign and Lord. The grace of God, his undeserved mercy and favour on us is the thing that causes sinful people to reorientate their lives, to turn around, to turn their back on sin, to turn back to Christ, and to seek to live lives that by the, the, the Spirit's help honour him. But the false teachers, they just twist that. They do what I find myself doing almost... <laughs> almost instinctively, and this I guess is the danger, they say, do you know what? God loves me. And because he loves me, it doesn't matter what I do because he's going to forgive me. So I can just live as I want. Ever played Monopoly? If you've, if you've ever played Monopoly, basically there's one square on the board which sends you straight to jail. And as you're going round the board, you're thinking, I don't want to land on that square, I don't want to go to jail. Unless community chest has been kind and you have your get out of jail free card. Yeah. Suddenly that square holds no fears for you. Just ignore it. Doesn't matter at all because you've got your get out of jail free card. That's the danger with twisting the grace of God. We behave as if we have a get-out-of-jail-free card. And so it doesn't matter how I live. I have a free pass from the consequences of holiness. These godless men teach that the grace of God means there's no such thing as sin. God just approves and affirms us and wants us, in fact, to be our best selves. Jesus says we must be born again. We must die to sin. We must crucify our sins. And although they don't admit it, what Jude says is that these false teachers are actually denying Jesus the right to be sovereign and Lord. They won't let him have the last word. They won't obey him. So when Jesus says, no one comes to the Father except through me, they say, no, 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 that's not right. No, no, you know, sincere Muslims and humble Buddhists and good secularists, they're all welcome. They're denying Jesus the right to be sovereign and Lord. It sounds loving, but it isn't. It's evil. So when Jesus says, the sexually immoral will not inherit the kingdom of God, they say, no, 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 no. All forms of loving sexual expression are good. God loves them. God blesses them. And it sounds so warm, so reasonable, so persuasive. 
and it denies Jesus the right to be sovereign and Lord. It's treason. Imagine if I had treatable cancer. Imagine if I went to the doctor and he was worried about upsetting me, so he said, no, Rory, actually, there's nothing wrong, you're fine, carry on. I didn't get the surgery. We wouldn't say that that doctor was good, would we? We wouldn't say what that doctor did was loving and kind. We'd say it was hopeless and awful. Hudson Taylor said, Jesus is either Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. And so Jude says we must fight, verse 3. Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt I had to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints. Christian people must stand against false teaching. We must stand against false teachers. It isn't the battle, actually, that Jude wants, is it? He wants to talk about the salvation that Christians share. But he says, I'm compelled because I see something so valuable under threat. He says, if you, if you won't let Jesus be sovereign and Lord, then the heart of the faith is under attack. And he urges us to contend, to fight, to exert ourselves in the defense of this faith, in the defense of Jesus' kingship. A and notice what he says about the faith. Verse 3. I felt I had to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints. That's you, if you're a Christian. You are a saint. The faith has been entrusted to you, bequeathed to you, actually, that you may live it out, believe it, proclaim it, and pass it on to another generation. So we cannot say, we cannot do a Rory and say, this is not my problem. Jude is saying it's all of our problems. We all have a role in fighting. Now, how we do it will take some thinking about it. And Jude does help us to think about that. <coughs> I'm very struck by 2 Corinthians chapter 10, which says, although we live in the world, we don't, we don't wage war like the world does. But let me mention, as I finish, one thing which will make us pack up and go home faster than anything else. Are you ready? It is the appeal to unity. People will say, let's not go there because it just shows how we're not united. Don't bring up things that are painful or about which we disagree because if you do, it'll show that we're not together. Don't be the awkward ones. Don't, don't make a fuss you're English here, you'll know there's almost nothing worse in the world, is there, than making a fuss. I mean, you can be served a cold meal in a drafty restaurant, but make a fuss? No! <laughs> they say you may not agree with what we're saying, but you don't have to say that you don't agree. In fact, what's often said is, do you know what? It's better for the gospel if you don't say anything. But Jude says you've got to fight because it's not the gospel and you cannot have unity with false teachers, with people who are God-less. No, because Jesus is our Lord and because he is our King and because we love people, we must contend. Let me pray for us. Oh Lord, we need your help, please, to be on our guard, to stand firm in the faith, to act with courage, to be strong, and to do everything in love. Would you please help us? Amen.